suggest that this machine, when it was new, thank you, Image Burn, for totally interrupting my sentence, but. Uh, Good day, folks. Jordan here with a hopefully interesting video for you all to watch. Now, this is, of course, image burn, but that's not going to be the subject of today's video, although it does play in a crucial role. The subject of today's video is, of course, going to be the more interesting thing on the floor here. This is a Dell Optiplex GX240 computer. Now, this is one of the ones that I got from the palette, in quote marks, of seven that I got in my last video, which if you haven't already watched that, there will be a card up there uh, for those who want to go and watch it. Now this machine is one of the functional units that is complete and I did add a hard drive. Although, rather sneakily, I took the drive out of my complete GX150 Pentium 3 and I put it into this because I do intend on putting a larger hard drive in the GX150. So this one has the 10 gig out of the GX150, although I'm not sure if it'll stay in there or not because, you know, it is quite small for a Pentium 4 computer, but really considering what you'll soon see for the CPU on this thing, it really is kind of iffy, but that's beside the point. The point of this video is the fact that I wanted to put an operating system on the system. And as a matter of fact, the license on the top suggests that this machine, when it was new... Thank you, Image Burn, for totally interrupting my sentence. But anyway, as I was going to say, the top license here suggests that this machine, when it was new, shipped with Windows NT Workstation 4.0. And obviously, I don't care if you take the license here, but one thing that's interesting is the layout of the key looks awfully familiar to that of a Windows 2000 or Windows XP license, and you'd be absolutely right. Turns out this machine was so late in the life of NT that you actually could, in fact, you know, order the system, which was made in around 2001 with NT4, if you were early enough to the you know, to the case, even though the system is designed to run Microsoft's own Windows XP. So that makes it very interesting. Now, um, this machine, when it was new, shipped with a 1.7 gigahertz Pentium 4, 128 megs of RAM. Don't know how much of a hard drive capacity it would have had when it was new, but I put in a 10 gig just because that's what I had lying around. And uh, this one, I believe, has the 16 megabyte ATI Rage 128 Ultra graphics card. They either came in a 16 or a 32 meg flavor. Of course, this is the 16 meg flavor that it has in there because it doesn't have the additional RAM chips. And also another cost cutting measure is that it's only got a CD-ROM drive. Other GX240 models could have been equipped with a CD-RW or DVD-ROM to my knowledge, but I think this is the base model that had only a CD-ROM drive. Although, rather thankfully, it does still have a three and a half inch floppy drive sitting in there. Now, one of the main things that got me interested in this particular system with the NT4 license and that of the other GX150 that does have the NT4 license on it as well, is how the heck they were able to get the USB ports working. Because normally Windows NT4 does not allow, you know, like USB of any kind. And this system has not only two USB ports on the front of it, but it also has two extra USB ports in the rear. And I guess that there was some official Dell patch that came with uh, NT when it was new that allowed for USB support. I don't know how well, but considering that these systems are some of the very first to include USB 2.0 support, my guess is that they just installed the chipset driver, which installed the hotfix in the process. Not quite sure how that's supposed to work, but that's what I can think of. So anyway, um, yeah, so we're going to go ahead and pop the CD in. Now I had to install Ultra ISO to modify this particular NT4 disk image to include some updates. For example, the Internet Explorer 6 package, the last security hotfix, and of course, Service Pack 6A. Because of course on NT4, if you modify the configuration of the OS um, in terms of hardware, every single time you have to reinstall the Service Pack, which in this case would be Service Pack 6A. Plus I just wanted to make sure that uh, the disk image had the Service Pack on there so that way when I do install it, I can then install the service pack if it's not already installed, which I might just do regardless, just to make sure that it's installed. So uh, I've also made a driver CD, which includes all the NT4 drivers from Dell's website, which is nice to see. So we can actually go ahead and install Windows NT 4.0 on this computer. Hopefully, I can't cross my fingers because of course I'm holding a CD, so oops. 
So I'm gonna go ahead and shut down the big old gaming PC so that way we get a little bit quieter background here whenever it decides it wants to shut down because of course it takes forever to shut down sometimes. I don't know why, but that's just how Windows 10 is. So now we can go ahead and uh, turn the TV off. I was gonna use the TV for this, but the reaction time is a little too, lo uh, little too long, so I'm gonna just use this Dell LCD over here. This is also one of the ones that I've not tested yet, so it's ought to be interesting to figure out how well this is going to work. So what I need to do real quick is I need to transfer the power cord over from this system to this one. And assuming that I get the orientation of the cord right, Yep, just did its power on self-test cycle there when you first plug in the power. And I'll turn it on here. I also did get the latest BIOS for the system, so when we get into Windows NT, we'll actually update the BIOS as well. This panel's in much better condition than the last one I used in the, uh, the last video. Uh, this one looks to just have a dim backlight at the top but that's not a real big deal. This has got no press marks in the panel, which is nice to see. So the system, like I mentioned, is a Pentium 4 1.7 gigahertz, which at its time, which would have been late 2001, which you can still buy a Pentium 3, this would have been their top of the line-ish CPU. Now, of course, the Pentium 3 was still pretty good at, at the time of this machine's manufacture. So the Pentium 4, you know, actually, you know, shares a lot with the Pentium 3 in the cache memory department. So this is a very, very early Pentium 4 because my GX150 was made around the same time as this GX240. Probably because the GX100 series was the lower end entry model uh, Optiplex and the 200 series in the time was their higher end one, which makes no sense to me in favor because, of course, the fact that, uh, you know, the 150 was designed for 2000 ME or 98 or NT4, whereas this one was designed for XP, so I don't know. I'm bad at explaining things, but you can kind of get an idea. So anyway, so let's see. Let me make sure the hard drive is detected properly. And it is, it's a 10 gig Western Digital and it works just fine. One downside of using this Pentium 4 is that the FSB is actually slower than that of a Pentium 3 933 megahertz, which is in my GX150, for example. So despite the clock speed being higher, I'm not convinced that the throughput of data performance is going to be any greater on this system because of that reduced bus speed from 133 to 100 based upon the Pentium 3s of the time. We also have 128 megs of RAM running at 133 megahertz, and they say AGP aperture. I'm not sure what the point is of this because there's nothing different about it, so I don't know what the point of that toggle is there for. So... Without further ado, let's go ahead and, assuming that the CD-ROM drive works, because I've not tested it yet, we will go ahead and pop it in, and we will let it boot up. Now, if it boots up into XP, that'll be funny, because, of course, this hard drive has XP on it, but I have not formatted it yet, so I wanted to leave it in NTFS format, so that way it would actually boot the hard drive a little bit, or it'd be a little bit quicker on the hard drive formatting side of things, because then it wouldn't have to deal with, like, FAT32 or anything like that, you know. And any second now, it should boot up off of the CD, and indeed it's going to, so that's good. Windows NT setup. Now, I'm sorry that I don't have any kind of direct capturing ability with this computer, or any computer in general. That's my apology. I don't have a capture card yet, but it is what it is. Let's see, your arm is doing some curious things, isn't it? I guess it's loading all the individual drivers now, as you can see. So I will be back once this boots up. Alrighty, so here we are at the setup program for NT4. It has picked up the IDE controller, that is nice. Setup has determined that one of your hard drives has more than 1,024 cylinders, so you cannot use the MS-DOS format, that's fine. I got a page down all the way to the bottom and press F8. This is a uniprocessor PC. That is correct. This is not a hyper-threaded computer, so I don't have to do that. We'll just do auto-detect. That's fine. Uh, XTAT or enhanced keyboard. Uh, Microsoft mouse port mouse. That's not correct. Um, let's see. We're going to do... Well, probably for the moment, we'll just do um, no mouse or other pointing device. And then now that it matches my computer. So what we're going to do is we're going to delete this partition, um, press L, and we're going to 
use this space. Now, hopefully, this doesn't have the limitation that, yeah, I just realized it says it right up there. It's going to make one 8 gigabyte partition on the drive. That is a downfall of NT4, is that because of the way the NT file system worked at the time, it's limited to 8 gig drives, or sorry, 8 gig partitions, because hard drives at that time, they were not big enough to meet the demand of the NT file system's maximum disk capacity at the time. So, unfortunately, we have to make a smaller than 8 gigabyte partition for the boot partition because it is that large. So what we're going to have to do There, I just took the easy route and I made a four gigabyte boot partition since apparently it doesn't like a seven and a half gigabyte partition for booting for whatever reason. So that's kind of annoying. So I've just decided to make myself a four gig partition for NTFS so that we'll at least have something to boot and put some programs on. I don't know if there was any kind of particular like original boot media that came with this machine when it was initially new uh, that contained a special version of NT 4.0 setup here at text based pro uh, setup that allowed you to use a boot partition larger than four gigabytes or something or another on a system like this, which initially shipped new with NT4, or if it was already partitioned like that from the factory, and then the initial setup from the original equipment manufacturer disc actually already did that for you. I'm really not sure. Somebody would have to give me some more insight on that, because I think that's quite interesting. Or I think that'd be quite interesting. I mean, that's just me. But anyway, we're gonna go ahead and let this partition I know a lot of people probably haven't seen NT 4.0 setup, but at this stage it's identical or virtually identical to that of Windows XP Professional or Home Edition setup or Windows 2000 setup. Virtually identical. In fact, I even think Windows NT 3.5 shared the same exact setup screen as NT 4, Windows 2000, and XP. I think they all shared the same setup. So if you've seen one of these, you've seen them all basically except for Windows 9 X's setup, so of course that's different. So anyways, this thing is about to get started with copying files. So I'm gonna see if uh, there's any other conflicts in setup that I need to film, and if not, well, you'll see me at the login screen of Windows NT4. Oh yeah, one thing you gotta watch out for, because of course, this is a workstation operating system, um, and they might have like RAID disks or something like that, uh, large or very full hard drives. They wanna do like an exhaustive secondary examination of the drives. I'm gonna skip this because I only have the one drive, so that's fine. But just watch out for that in case you're flying through the setup and you're wondering why it's taking so long. Well, you gotta watch out because it'll probably do a disc check if you're not paying attention. So <laughs> beware. So here we go. So this is something you gotta watch out for when uh, you're installing Windows NT. It initially installs itself as a fat file system and then post setup on the text mode it'll actually convert to NTFS. So you have to watch out for that. Um, but really that's kind of a nitpick because um, Windows 2000, I think when you're upgrading, it does the same thing or something similar. I think obviously if you're upgrading from Windows 9X, you got to watch out because it'll convert from FAT to NTFS if you opt to do that. But in this case, it initially installs as FAT and then converts to NTFS. I'm not sure if that's a byproduct of Windows 95 or what, but I'm not sure you know, what really causes it to do that, but whatever. It looks as if it's fine now, so I'm going to go ahead and do an auto. Typical, because there is no device drivers installed. So that's why they failed. Go figure. <laughs> going to do the three finger salute to boot this thing up, and then uh, type in my lovely administrator password. And to the naked eye, unless of course you saw the screen, you'd barely be able to tell the difference between Windows 95 and Windows NT 4.0, unless of course you opened up the start menu and saw Windows NT Workstation in the start menu. So yeah, anywho, um, I believe this is just service pack one of NT 4, which hopefully should not be a problem when installing stuff later. I should just be able to install service pack six and be done with it. Of course, uh, application performance is going to be maximum. Um, I believe I, Let's go to Device Manager and let's see... Oh. 
So as you can see, here's one drawback of Windows NT 4.0 over Windows 95, and that is the older style of uh, device manager sort of thing here. There was no like special device manager like there was in uh, Windows 95, of which it gave you a device manager inside the system properties. Instead, you get the older style Windows NT style of device thing, and I don't believe, to my knowledge, that there is any kind of device manager thing inside of here. However, of course, one thing you did get above Windows 95 was the ability to control services, which you can do there, and directly control tape backup devices, telephony devices, if you were to have one installed inside of your system. So if I can close out of this, I guess not. I guess I get to control, delete my way out of this, of course. Now this screen ought to look familiar to any Windows NT user, or 2000 or XP of uh, without the welcome screen. That should look very familiar. Uh, I think it's run DLL 32 that's currently running. So I'll get that out of there. That's another advantage over Windows 95 as a physical, like actual device, uh, task manager, sorry. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, let's see. I'm gonna go ahead and eject that CD out of the drive. All right, eject. And it should come right out. And there we go. So now let's get some drivers installed, I think. So there you can see there's my CD that I've made, which has more than just the drivers for the GX240 for Windows NT. I actually have all the 270 drivers and the 150 drivers because of course I have more than uh, the 240. Oops, I forgot. You have to like do a copy and paste command with these. So copy and paste. All right, and then uh, we just need the NT4 folder to go onto the desktop. And then we'll see just how many things are copied over here. There's quite a few on Dell's website. Not as much as uh, Windows XP or maybe Windows 2000 for that matter, but still a number of drivers. So anyways, first things first, we're gonna go ahead and uh, delete the shortcut because of course but also we're gonna go ahead and run this BIOS file update. I don't remember if this needs any floppy disks or not. I don't think so. That eh, looks like it does need to have a floppy disk based uh, BIOS update. So I will do that later. So we will do that in a little bit. But anyway, let's go ahead and get these drivers installed. So sound, I guess, sure, we'll do that because we'll get that out of the way. This has SoundMax integrated audio, of course. It does not have the um, like the Creative Sound Blaster cards that some of these machines would have shipped with if they were running XP when they were new. We'll get the Intel chipset, which I'm not sure if it will enable the uh, USB support. I'm not sure. Uh, I've got two Internet Explorer windows. That's kind of annoying. That's got no document. Well, of course. Um, we'll just run the setup here. All right, and there we go. It should have NT4 drivers already because, of course, this was designed for, uh, yeah. Requires a supported chipset platform running on a supported operating system. Check the README file. So where is the special installer that runs on NT4? Uh, it requires Windows 98 or something or another. Well, that's annoying. Because there was no chipset driver for NT4 on Dell's website. So I didn't think that this one would actually work. So I'm not surprised. I will have to find that later, but anyway, here is the Rage 128 Ultra graphics chip driver. So you can see it's specifically made for Windows NT. All right, so let's go ahead and restart and let's see if it actually installed. Well, you know, drivers when it comes to NT4 are kind of picky, especially considering the fact that, you know, some semi-rare cases, if you're not lucky, will actually <laughs> cause you to have to reinstall your service pack, which is not convenient at all. Sweet, a new graphics driver has been installed. So now we just need to set the resolution and color up ourselves. It's just using this 640 by 416 color thing temporarily, so that way it will actually let me like do this. I'm not sure why, but it's been a pain with installing the driver. I'm not sure why it doesn't stick. It's supposed to have the um, the Rage 120 Ultra display thing in the bottom in there, so I'm not sure what's causing it to not work. But I don't know. Anyway, I'll just go ahead and just do this. Yeah, it does work. Oh, isn't that just nice? Okay, so uh, let's see what else do we need to install here. Ultra ATA storage, yeah, that 
probably be a good idea to make sure that the, uh, the disk is being properly recognized. Okay, so installing on Windows NT. I might have had to do this with the chipset, I think. So uh, we're going to open. And hopefully this actually installs, unlike the chipset. Um, I might try the chipset again just to make sure that it'll actually work because I'm not sure if that prompt was initiating the setup or if it had some kind of like special NT4 style of thing. So I'm not sure what's up with that, but this is an INF update which is designed for XP 2000 ME 98 second edition and 95 OSR 2.1. Uh, 2 so I don't think this is going to work either, but it's worth a try. Alright, so I just need to press install now, open, and maybe it might work. This is an older utility, so I'm not sure. There's the README, which is talking about what OS is it supposed to work on. And it requires a supported chipset platform running on a supported operating system. That's not surprising to see, because of course I was expecting that to do that. And this would be the networking, which it looks to need the driver to, so we'll go ahead and uh, do that. So as it turns out, I actually had to install Service Pack 6 before I could actually get the display adapter to work, because as you can see now, it's working properly. So, woohoo! So now, I can actually set true color at 1024 by 768, and... Bada boom, bada bing, native resolution of the display, which looks really freaking sharp and really good. So I'd say that is a success in my book. So I don't know if there's anything else that I needed to install other than the BIOS, but we'll go ahead and we'll get uh, this security update done. And we'll get Internet Explorer 6 installed, and then this thing will be a perfect running-ish, to some extent, um, Windows NT 4.0 system complete with sound, networking, working graphics, and all that stuff, so sweet. So, this is apparently a file that allows USB support on Windows NT, which also includes a USB, whoops, it's not focused, USB mass storage device driver. So, hey, that's pretty cool. So we don't need the actual, like, um, device driver for this Vista imaging USB camera. We need the mass storage device driver, the, U the USB HID, and the USB stack. We probably should let all that install, and then that should allow for maybe some kind of USB support inside of NT4. You know, I don't know, but we'll find out. And would you look at that, we have a USB icon in the status tray. Or the system tray, sorry. And we have USB viewer. And as you can see, there we have it. It does properly detect the USB hardware on this computer, which I was really surprised to see that it actually managed to find it. So that, that's pretty cool. So now we have all four USB ports working, which is fantastic. And now we can go ahead and uh, we can install Internet Explorer 6, but I'm going to wait on that because I actually want to try browsing the Internet here on Internet Explorer 4. Uh, what is this? Internet Explorer 3, I think that's what's on this. Let's go ahead and figure that out here. It's probably Internet Explorer 3. No, it's Internet Explorer 2. How about that? Doesn't even get any older than that. Of course, Internet Explorer was based initially on NCSA Mosaic, which was, of course, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, or something or another. And uh, this has SSL 1.0, so I don't know how many websites are going to get to work, but... Mm -hmm.